Well, it's pretty hard to believe it's been over three months since this lockdown for the coronavirus started. I'm still here, still doing analyses. I don't do them every day now because so many other things that we have to do in life. But today I want to present just a look at the data in the U.S. by state. So I think at this point it's important for us to understand what's going on in the states and we have to take into account what it means to be testing positive and and how that relates to our ability to go back to live life in a normal fashion. So what, I'm, what I decided to look at was instead of just testing positive, I'm more interested in mortality rate because clearly we're gonna have a lot of people testing positive. That's given. We've been following this disease for quite a while now. We know how it behaves. We're not getting any major surprises anymore in terms of a population we have a large enough sample to represent our population. So we understand how this disease behaves or how the virus behaves, I should say that. And so instead of just worrying about people getting infected because people will get infected, particularly as we start getting back out into our normal lives, I'm more worried about what happens to the people who get infected. So death is the key here. So this is a figure of mortality rates. I started this May 2nd, and then of course today is June 22nd. And what you'll notice here is I don't have data for everybody over this whole period. For instance, North Carolina and Virginia, I added late. I also added Arizona, but today for the first time, so it doesn't even show up here, but I do have the data available in this, in this uh, table. And I highlighted what I thought was very important here. Now, you should note that when I say mortality, the mortality rate is the number of deaths divided by the population mid-year. So normally we do this per year, right? And we don't have we don't have a year's worth of data yet, or we can't say this is what coronavirus did in 2019, this is what it did in 2020. We just don't have those data yet. This is the best possible estimate I have of the population. You take the deaths divided by the population and multiply it by 100,000. So this tells us how many individuals died per every 100,000. Like for instance, if I took 100,000 people, I should have in New York 160 deaths out of every 100,000 people. So I sorted these this table by mortality rate. Now the reason I didn't do prevalence, so prevalence is the number of existing cases, whether they're new cases or cases that have already been around, divided by the population. And this is also multiplied by 100,000. The reason I didn't sort here is because in some cases, I'm not getting the data for the number recovered. Like for instance, Massachusetts, Illinois, Georgia. So that's kind of an unfair comparison, but you can still look at the prevalence. This is the best possible data we have. I avoid looking at raw numbers, like confirmed cases, deaths, and active, because the raw numbers really are, they're too hard to understand. You need a context, and that's why we provide a context by per 100,000. Some people are using per capita. I think that's kind of stupid, to be honest. It doesn't make sense. It makes sense to have a number, and how many people in this number are dead? Percent fatal, or this is what's known as case fatality. This is how this is cal this uh, statistic is calculated. It's deaths divided by the number that are infected. So, for instance, here you had 31,125 deaths in New York divided by 3879.36 confirmed. Get multiplied by 100 by 100 to make a percentage. You got 8.023. So that there's an 8 percent chance of dying in New York if one is infected with the coronavirus. The highest is in Connecticut, and right now the lowest is in Texas. Right, so this, I, this is for today, so I have Arizona data as well here. Arizona, it's 2.565. So I do have data for Arizona today. Like I said in the, in the chart, I didn't have it. So Arizona, I actually can give you the prevalence here, that motorcycle coming by here. I can give you the prevalence for Arizona and it's uh, 601, 602 per 100, 
thousand because we do have the recovered number. Some states I can't, unfortunately, I can't. So in states like New York and New Jersey, where we have all the data, it's pretty high still. It's over uh, almost a one and a half thousand people per one hundred thousand are infected. But not everybody's dying, which is obviously what we we want to see because. As people go back to work, they want to feel, okay, well, you know, I can go back to work and I may get sick, but I'm probably not going to die from it. That's what we'd like to, to people to feel so that you might feel sick. Now, the, the interesting thing is that when I look at who gets sick and who dies and who get, has to be put on a ventilator, those are things we'd like to avoid as well. Interestingly, I saw a study yesterday that showed that there's about a seven times greater chance of being put on a ventilator if one is has a body mass index of 35 or above compared to an individual who has a body mass index of 25. So you're talking about people who are morbidly obese. So, people, so obesity, and even with obesity itself, not just morbid obesity, there's an increase, a dramatic increase of the in the odds of being put on a ventilator. It's weird. It's not weird, actually. We know obesity is not a healthy, it's not a healthy situation. But I think we need to take into account who are the people who are being most affected by this and all other, whether viruses or bacteria or what, or maladies in general. Those are people who don't take care of themselves. So, look, we have to take better care of ourselves and for older people we're going to be at risk anyway because we you know we're just our body stop we're not going to be functioning perfectly as we get older however that doesn't mean we shouldn't be exercising and taking care of ourselves to try to avoid the worst of the worst situations anyway i hope this is helping in some way i just want everybody to understand that that life is going to have to go on and we're just going to have to figure out a way to deal with these situations by being protective of people who are most vulnerable We've done a great job. I live in Pennsylvania, and we've done a great job here reducing, or as they say, flattening our curve, perhaps. I mean, we're not, we never reached the, the heights of, of our neighbor, New Jersey, for instance. Uh, even we're not reaching those heights, right? But, but we're, doing, we're doing a pretty good job because people are actually following the rules. Now, not everybody will always follow the rules. I was out somewhere the other day, yesterday, with my son and we went to a museum and people in the museum in the in the office weren't wearing masks and I'm like uh, I, before I went in I said do I need to wear a mask they said oh only if you think you're ugly you can't make a joke you know it's funny uh -huh. and I you know the people who work in this museum are pretty old and I'm thinking wow you know I I worry for you and I hope people aren't using politics or issues like that to inform their decisions because that does not work and uh, it's just being smart and being protective of oneself is what's necessary and of one's loved ones and one's families okay be safe thank you bye